Good evening, everyone. Several years. I'd like to invite you to the 139th annual meeting and 1,240th regular meeting. We determined that it's kind of a combination of the two tonight. After a lot of uh, discussion and consternation, that's what we'll come up with. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone out there in TV land. Um, and I would like to request the minutes from the last regular meeting be read by Secretary Hevel. Yeah. Favorite part. Favorite part. Favorite part. Please, 1239th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was called to order on the 2nd of November by President Matt Huffington at approximately 7 p.m. in room WG33 of the National Museum of Natural History. 17 members and eight guests were in attendance with 21 virtual visitors. Recording Secretary Gary Hebel read the minutes of the October meeting and the meetings were approved after suggested improvements regarding available podcast information. President elect Don Weber noted that a lecture by Joe Cornelius is scheduled for November the 15th at the headquarters of AAAS. President Matt Buffington outlines progress on the slate of new society officers for 2024. The slate is normally presented during the November meeting but the position for president-elect, co-editor, and curator are not yet finalized. Matt noted that he will advise <laughs> society members of progress by email during the next month. The advertised speaker for the November meeting will not be available for the meeting. Fortunately, his wife, Jill Obersky, a postdoc presently at the Smithsonian agreed to replace Brendan for an evening lecture. She was introduced by his program chair, Alan Norbaum, who thanked her for substituting for her husband on an emergency basis. Dr. Obersky <laughs> met Dan by saying that this talk was a summary of her dissertation at the University of California, Davis, and was basically a phylogenetic analysis of the ant genus Dory Myrmex. There are some 14,000 known species of ants and easily 20% more to formally describe to science. They are known to constitute 80% of the biomass of all animals, reaching great numbers in the tropics. There are 61 valid species known in the genus Dory Marmex, 27 of which are in North America. Individuals are quite small and systematics provide clues to the history of the thought earth. There are hints that historical range expansion has occurred. Some lumping and splitting of species groups has taken place. Currently, four species groups are known. Developing a key to species will be difficult, possible. Examination of colony queens will be helpful for a thorough understanding of this group of ants. The meeting was adjourned at 8.30 p.m. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes as they were read by Secretary Hevel? Having heard none, can I have a motion to accept the minutes as read? Moved. Seconded? Seconded. Thank you, Secretary Hevel. Okie dokie. <laughs> Would any new members or guests here tonight like to introduce themselves? <laughs> Having heard none. Oh, are there any online? Oh. Sorry, my mouth's full. No pressure. Have a taste. Yeah. Go to the answer. Hi, my name is Forge. I come from the University of Maryland. But so. This is my first meeting. Cool. Oh, good. 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 Oh, good.
Is there anyone on mine, program chair, that would like to say hello? <laughs> Any new members that would like to say hello, visitors? Okay, we can't really tell if you're out there. Raise their hand. Please raise your hand if you want to say hello. Okay. Uh, the next order of business is just the annual meeting. My last as president. Um, is to review the ID business in total. I'm going to make a summary so it'll all be published in the um, probably next year's volume two of the meetings. So all this published every single year. So I asked for a report all the uh, officers of the executive team um, and I prepared a slide presentation that's at my house. So I won't be giving that now. So I'm gonna summarize from my notes. Uh, program chair, Norbaum, uh, uh, summarized that uh, in January, Lourdes Chamorro, February, Bob Kimsey, in March, Andrew Jansen, in April, John Ulmer, in May, Giovanna, Magdalena Yaso Martinez. Um, in October, Alan Cabrero, and in November, Joe Obersky, which we just heard about, the, the, the stand in, but no one stands in for Jill. And tonight we'll hear from Brendan Budino. So we've got a full slate, a bunch of amazing talks. I love hearing all of them. I only missed Jones, um, but the rest I was able to. And Bob Kipsey was a remote, probably one of the more uh, difficult to watch in some cases. <laughs> Thank you, program chair, Alan Orbaum. This is the report from the Young Entomologist Group, or the YEG, which is uh, chaired by uh, uh, David Adamski. This is the 11th year of the YEG. Um, as they assumed their new normal, they went on Zoom for a while. Um, and to give you a little bit of a background, the YEG are, these are like kids, like 10 and below, like trying to get them into natural history at an early age and explore the natural world. Uh, on February, I'm just going to kind of highlight some of this. On the 19th of February, Dave gave a title, Insects and Their Arthropod Relatives. We saw another talk on recycling the, recycling and recyclable bowls with Loris Tomorrow filling a fact-filled comical presentation on her study group, The Weevils. So thank you, Dr. Tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the Yeggers went outdoors in May, uh, Caledonia State Park in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Looking at the red salamanders, Redden State Park. <laughs> uh, they went to look at the uh, uh, limulus, the horseshoe crabs, to do tagging, show how tagging is done. Um, and David, um, if you don't know, um, suffered a fairly serious medical condition, and we were really worried about him. And he has rebounded in a remarkable way. David, if you're out there, we really appreciate your service to society. And uh, he notes here, as a personal note, I want to take, I want to thank Marion Bundes. While on her cell phone with me on Saturday, July 30th, recognized I was having a medical emergency and called the District of Columbia EMT and was taken to George Washington Hospital. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. So uh, the YEG continues to go strong. Um, and thank you, David Damsky, for your service. David Furt. They just had their um, <laughs> annual meeting at Huntley Meadows Ooh. last Saturday, and uh, for whatever reason, he asked me to speak. So they're, I can report that they're doing, they're live and well, and Dave's, Dave's doing really well. Excellent. Excellent. Great to hear. Great to hear. Okay. Next report is from our president elect, Don Weber. Um, he wrote, uh, my main task for the year was to organize the ESW banquet, which took place on June 15th at Marymount University in Boston location, featuring talk using caterpillars in biosystematic and ecological studies and as beacons of climate change and befalling the American West with Dr. David L. Wagner, professor of Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, University of Connecticut. Uh, due to the excellent arrangements uh, by Dr. Susan Avellini, professor of biology at Marymount, we were able to accommodate an excellent variety of potluck dishes we actually took over from a potluck that was there just before us. So that was awesome. Like cookies and shaking the ice. We had ice. Yeah, it was great. Um, it was a metro friendly venue. You forgot the beverages. Oh, oh whoops. We don't know if this location will be available again for 2024, uh, but we will work with the president elect to assure we have a good venue 
for that banquet. Uh, he also helped, uh, Dr. Uh, what, Dr. Uh, Weber also helped uh, provide the slate of nominees, which we'll read out tonight uh, for ESW executive. And I'd like to add in here, this isn't really necessarily officially what the president is supposed to do, but Don organized a C.D. Riley uh, walking tour of DC um, here at the museum as well and at the National Agricultural Library. And uh, it was, I loved it. It was very emotional. You it was very, with it, me, was, it, was, it was, well, I just did the part of the museum, but it was, it was pretty amazing. And I got to see the National Ag Library inside, uh, got to see an herbal in 1509 that looks like it was printed maybe a hundred years ago, not right after Columbus discovered the United States in North America. So um, it was a pretty amazing, we're hopefully gonna try to do something like this for the society of well, and uh, maybe less formal with no shuttle buses and stuff. But uh, I think we're gonna, and we're gonna continue trying to find where C.D. Riley's house was uh, near the Obama residence. Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Weber? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Preliminary treasurer's report presented or provided by Dr. Abby Kula. Uh, we started November 1, 2022, with $70,000 and change. Special publication fund about $93,000 with a total asset around $143,000. Uh, we ended this year at about $174,640 um, with money going out and net changes coming in that left us with a total plus of $10,840. So that's good for profit. That keeps us afloat at probably the rate of inflation. So does that include all our uh, everything, stocks and all that stuff? That includes everything summarized. She's going to have a breakdown for the auditing the video, which we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and on, on that, on the investment <laughs> side of things, we are still working with the attorney on getting the final version of the bylaws revised that will allow us to become a 5013C <laughs> nonprofit legally, like and so that avoids tax situations. And then we can then invest the money in really lucrative ways and not worry about uh, tax implications. So we've been waiting on big investments until that gets sorted out. So apparently we've been operating for, I don't know, a while and uh, not had this, so we're gonna have it now. I'm being told by past president to that, so there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on, editor's report. This is from Dr. Mark Metz. The manuscript backup from 2022 has lingered into 2023 with an incredible amount of pages to copy and edit and format for the journal. <clears throat> Submissions of manuscripts were and remain down. I presume this is a combination of tardiness of the issues and a post-COVID lull. Issue 125 wasn't published until November 16th. 125.2 is currently in second proofs and contains 10 articles. Manuscripts still need copy editing and formatting for issue 125.3. And there's not enough reviewed submissions yet for a final issue of the year. This is something that Dr. Metz has uh, uh, provided some concern with our last executive meeting. Finding reviewers for manuscripts is becoming an issue. People are just either not responding or just saying no. So that obviously slows things down um, considerably. <clears throat> um, due to the incredible time commitment needed to properly copy edit journals, uh, articles for the journal, this is his last year as editor. He's going to remain functionally as an associate editor and help the new editor familiar, get familiar with the production pipeline. And he will, Mark will continue as the doctor subject editor. We have uh, uh, some new subject editors for Hymenoptera, and that's Dave Smith. Some new subject editors. For Dave Smith, that's uh, for Hymenoptera, that's Dave Smith, and for Diptera, uh, William Murphy. The remaining subject editors, Jerry Cook for Small Orders and Heteroptera, well, Aquatic Heteroptera, Tom Henry for Heteroptera and Sterdrinka, Ron Cho for Akari, Floyd Shockley for Coleoptera, and Al Wheeler for Book Reviews, Jamie Zonheiser for Hemiptera Akinarinka, plan to stay in position. These volunteers deserve the gratitude of the whole society. <laughs> Last report I have here is from the membership and communications secretary, Elizabeth Young. In 2023, the society had 100 active personal memberships. 
While the number of personal memberships has generally decreased in recent years, so 204 active personal memberships in 2019, it has increased slightly from last year, 178 active personal memberships in 2022. There were eight new personal members added in 2023. Of the 180 active personal memberships, 44 paid to receive printed copies of the journal and 136 electronic only subscribers. Uh, so that's uh, definitely something for the next year is deciding with the proceedings whether to go fully electronic or to remain partial print, partial electronic. Uh, but as long as people want them, I think we can accommodate them through our, our printing house. Um, are there any comments or questions about the reports as I read them? Um, you mentioned the issue numbers. How close to parity is the journal? I mean, is, is, what year is it in? <laughs> I guess how many? How many? How many issues? We're are in twenty three. Okay. Yeah, but we're trying to close out issue four of twenty three. We don't have enough to to actually begin production. This is twenty three. Right, but so issue, to... issue four of, oh. of 2023. Sorry, of 122. 120, 125. Okay, issue forget, 125. forget the issue numbers. How many, what the, the most recent issue is what year and what number? It's 23, number two. Number two, got yes. it. Okay, yeah. so we're just two issues behind. Yeah, That's not not, 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 not too bad, not too bad. Nope. Okay. We've now moved on to the election of new officers. And it's the one page I failed to print in my office. So I'm going to go <laughs> off memory. <laughs> Elizabeth Young, membership secretary, has agreed to remain in office. Gary Hevel, recording secretary, has agreed to remain in office. Alan Norbaum, program chair, has agreed to remain in office. Um, we have a president elect who's going to become president, I'm going to become past president. Our new president elect is Andrew Jensen, who has run unopposed. He <laughs> <laughs> will become president elect tonight. Um, the, the last one is custodian. Second to last. Second to last. Treasurer. Treasurer. Abby Kulo remained in position. Thank you. Um, Talita, how do I pronounce your last name? Simois. Simois. Talita Simois is agreed to become, I kind of appointed her custodian. Uh, you will become custodian tonight, running on a post. Um, and I failed to get a report. I failed to ask uh, Alyssa Seaman for a report from uh, her previous tenure as custodian. So that will be in the hard copy. Um, but it will be helping Talita get into that position. If anyone wants to volunteer on a weekend to move a bunch of old issues of the proceedings, uh, please let us know because we're going to be cleaning out the library annex room on the fifth floor east wing and getting it sorted out and figuring out where everything is and kind of making uh, 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 table contents of that work. So, also co editors. The editor. Oh boy. Thank you. Editor. Okay. So, Thank you, Mark, Dr. Mark Metz, for being editor, for seeing the proceedings through. Um, we He announced to uh, the executive a few months ago that he would be stepping down. The uh, editor is a very difficult position. It's a lot of work. Um, and uh, having done it myself with Tom Henry, um, it can be uh, challenging to, to, to manage so many manuscripts and so many different uh, personalities. Um, and kind of out of the blue, uh, Dr. Jerry Cook, Sam Houston University, approached uh, me just via email, like, hey, is there a way maybe I could be helping out the editor, you know? And I was like, whoa, this is great. So we put his name forward, and he has um, graciously agreed to be co-editor with Dr. Mark Metz until Dr. Metz has finished his uh, kind of passing the torch to, to Jerry, at which point, at that point, Jerry will either be editor or there'll be another co-editor with him if he wants a co-editor. Um, there's nothing in the bylaws one way or the other. It's a, we have an accommodation for both mm -hmm. situations. So uh, thank you, Dr. Jerry Cook. It's great to have you on board. And the executive team is here to help uh, 
work with you um, whatever way we can. Okay, that is the end of the election of new officers. Thank you, everyone. Is there any, un oh, sir? We have to actually move, move and vote. Yeah, well, they're running. If they're running on a pose, do you, you have to get one? Yeah, you still have to okay. just, I move we accept the slate proposed by President Buffington. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Is there a second to that? Yeah, have a point of order. Point of order. Are there any other? Point of you're order. Supposed to actually call for nominations from the floor. Yes. Yeah, just, just in case someone wants to challenge. Okay. Are there any nominations oh, from the what. floor for the positions <laughs> that I just described? Having heard none, can I get a motion to accept the nominations as yeah, yeah. I read them? So much. So so second. Much. All right. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. This is an authoritarian. Sorry. All the question, and then you say, yeah. How many people vote? All in favor, say. All in favor, thank you. You should be, I'm supposed to be telling you how to do this, and you're telling me, this is great. All in favor of the slate as I read it, say aye. 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 Okay, that's our... All opposed, say no. <laughs> All say abstentions. So. All abstentions, say so. Hearing none, present. the motion passes. The motion passes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any unfinished business? Barely. <laughs> Is there any new business? <laughs> Presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. Mm. Does anyone have any notes? I don't have, I don't have a note, but I have specimens. Help. That's best. I just want to, uh, for anyone who's interested, this is a new company, um, Pachowski out of Poland, who uh, <laughs> we are now negotiating with to make our drawers <laughs> and um, unit tricks. They're partnered with Harris Haney from HH Elements, but recently Floyd and I met with them and they were at ESA, at ECN, I should say. And um, if anybody wants to see their catalog, they make cabinets and drawers of various styles. So, you're welcome to take a look at this. Awesome. And this, this is the newest Xerxes side t shirt. Yes, I, pretty much. Well, let's see. I know some people here don't like Xerxes so much, but I've been a member of the Why would they not? You're a rival. No, no. He, he's, he's, he's poking fun at the fact that we were poking fun at Xerxes for wanting to list them on our product blog. Yeah, like an hour ago. Anyway, I would like so. to say that company, by the way, we ordered several, we ordered drawers from the, not a large quantity. Who's we? The, at the University of Bonn, um, the Institute for Evolutionary Biology and Zoology, we ordered several drawers from them for random specimens collected on collecting trips, and they're of high quality. So, does the museum in Bonn use them? Uh, it wasn't for the museum, okay. but uh, the Kearney Museum. But it wasn't, it wasn't for them. It was just for our lab and, and a cabinet as well. And yeah, they're they're a very good company. Yeah. And they they make cabinets and drawers and everything. They, they also exhibited at the uh, yeah. Secret of Congress this summer. Oh, that's right. Really nice nice stuff. Their son is like a, a harp player. Yeah. He, he provided entertainment during one of the meetings. He didn't string you up. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to harp on that too much. <laughs> Shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> you don't have a presidential immunity anymore. No, that's it. right. I do for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Um, I, I have something to share. Sorry. I was just going to present your t-shirt. Oh, yeah. You can um, present the t-shirt. Oh, yeah. I wanted to. I was going to ask <laughs> yeah. for you to explain your t-shirt. Drunk alien. So, <laughs> Dr. Tomorrow brought, bought this for me at the end of the day. It is an alien drinking an unknown substance riding on a eucaryotic wasp. Just because. Oh, it's okay. It's not a plan. Yeah. It's all there is to it. I got it. Yeah. 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 No, but supposedly it's John Harity. Yeah. John Harity is writing the Eucharist. Yeah. Well, he's the yeah. Who else would be? Uh, Who else would be? There's a lot of people that so were remain unnamed that could be doing that same thing. <laughs> uh, Very cool. Um, an actual exhibit that I, I've got here is The Wasps of the World, A Guide to Every Family by Simon Van Hort and Gavin Frog. Oh, wow. Simon's a, a pal of mine. Well, Gavin is too. 
when, when we were in South Africa recently, um, uh, Simon gave me this copy. And uh, it's already out of date because they just doubled the number of Calcidoy families. So it's, it's no longer <clears throat> cl close enough. So I'll pass it around. That's very nice. It's just a kind of a one page spread for each family and a summary of what you might find in a read about them. So. Okay. I think we're now ready. Oh, one last thing that uh, past president tomorrow has just reminded me. Um, there will be automatic renewals for membership if you've selected that. And what we have found is you don't get an email saying you've just been automatically renewed. Mm -hmm. So if you see a charge and you become alarmed, that's what that is. So we're asking people to kind of check and the renewal date is a rolling renewal date. So when you join, that's when you will be charged. So we used to do it every December, uh, regardless of when you join. Now it's whenever you actually join. So everyone will have a different date. We just wanna make everyone aware of that out there. Okay, anything else before the big moment? <laughs> Having heard nothing, I'll turn the floor over to the program chair. Eleanor. <clears throat> um, before I introduce our speaker, I'll just note we have uh, 19 Zoom participants. Gary keeps track of all of them. Um, so tonight, uh, after waiting for a whole month to do this, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Brendan Budno. Brendan is an evolutionary and systematic morphologist. He earned a BS at Evergreen State College in 2012, then spent a year as a research technician at the University of Utah. He completed a PhD at the University of California, Davis, with Bill Ward. Um, he was then an Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellow in Germany from 2020 to 2022. The Philetische Museum, founded by Ernst, Ernst Haeckel at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. He's currently a Peter S. Buck Fellow at the Smithsonian and will be starting a permanent position as Hymenopter, a curator at the Sinkenberg After Museum Frankfurt this coming January. His taxonomic expertise is in ants and Hymenoptera, and he has published on all insect orders and tardigradia. His work on the origin and evolution of male genitalia I I would love to talk about tardigrades, but uh, the best tardigrade that I found was in Dominican amber, and it was really ugly. Um, That's the rest of it were gorgeous. <laughs> I find every tardigrade to be gorgeous. They are. I oh think. yeah. I've got I've got friends. I send them tardigrades. If you want to be on my friends tardigrade list, please let me know. Nothing. Okay. Nice. So. Well, I guess any further ado, thank you for the very nice introduction, Alan, and thank you all for being here today, and thank you also uh, for giving me a break on being sick after getting back from Brazil. I really appreciate that I get a second chance to give this talk. Uh, I spoke just recently at the SI seminar, and this talk is going to be quite different. Today, I'm going to be speaking about the phenomics and evolution of the hymenoptera and beetles. <laughs> I would love to include them, but their genitalia are not spectacular. You will see why that becomes relevant later. Um, so I've broken my talk today into four parts. First, I'll be talking about coleoptera and the problem of parsimony. Second, I'll be talking about phenomics, which is basically big data for morphology. Then I'll apply phenomic methodology to fossils. Then I'll apply it to living species and see what we can understand from this approach to entomology. So to begin with, um, I like beetles. And you are probably familiar with this particular topology. 
for the suborders of the Coleoptera. This is well supported Sanger sequencing, <clears throat> genomic sequencing. We're going to ignore that one study I struck out, but the bottom line is uh, because it was botched. Um, we have four suborders polyphaga, adiphaga, mixophaga, and archistomata. Archistomata historically were thought to be sister to the rest. We'll talk about that um, in a moment. What I want to show here first, though, is the fossil record of the Coleoptera from the Permian, that is to say, the end of the Paleozoic to the Triassic, which is to say, the beginning of the Mesozoic, the period of the dinosaurs, essentially. Um, Could I interrupt just a sec? I'm so sorry. Would you mind sharing your screen via Zoom for those of us who uh, wanted to be there but weren't able to be in person? We're sure. seeing sort of a totally awesome hallucinogenic hyper blur. Sure. <laughs> Hello, you're in focus again, but um, we're still unable to see your presentation. Is it okay. possible for you to do a share screen via Zoom so that we can? Uh, we'll see. Working. If it's not possible, then you just need to speak very descriptively. <laughs> I think I can do that. But... <laughs> All right. Thank you for speaking up. Um, I really appreciate that because I'm quite excited to get this talk. This looks great, by the way. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to hide this. Uh, I don't know how to hide this. I'm floating meeting controls. Ooh, yes. Awesome. Good. Cool. So we're just going to, um, ah, also beetles, walk through this. Here's that beautiful topology, uh, polyphagus sister to everyone else. Here is the fossil record of the beetles in the Paleozoic and the Triassic. Each dot represents a deposit. Um, <clears throat> the size of the dot represents the number of species known from there. And what I want to point out is that there are about 14 species known from the very immediate beginning of the per Permian. Um, here's the end Permian extinction, which was the greatest apocalypse of life on the history of Earth. And I want to point out here as a hymenopterist, the first fossil hymenopteran is well into the late Triassic, and already there are over 400 species of beetles described from the fossil record at this time. Given that Hymenoptera are sister to all other holometabola, we should have a fossil record for both orders going into the Carboniferous. We don't. That's fascinating. It's beside the point. Right now, I want to, um, to focus on a single fossil from the, the earliest Permian, literally 299 million years ago, 1 million years after the Carboniferous, the, uh, uh, the Carbonifer Carboniferous rainforest collapse, we should say. Um, this is a beetle. It's known as Maravacolius permianus. It's been uh, attributed to the family Chicarticoelidae. When we look at this beetle, there's a number of things that we can notice immediately. Uh, for many of us, we would notice immediately that the longitudinal veins of the forewings or the elytra are not parallel. We would also notice that there are what we would call window punctures <laughs> between the veins. The head is uh, prognathous. Uh, There's a number of features that are very distinctly beetle-like here. But one thing that is fantastic is that you can see here, this is the tip of that abdomen, and it's a very flexible abdomen. And here's the tip of that four wing. Taking a diagrammatic approach to thinking about this, we can see that the Chikarikoelidae actually have extremely long wings. The hind wings cannot fold. They do not have the folding mechanism. It's not obvious whether they can fold in a cigar shape like extant Archistomata can. We, we're calling this basically a tectiform uh, elytral um, uh, morphology. Basically, this is an intermediate, effectively, between something you would think of as Neuroptera and real beetles. If we look at the cross-section, we would see that there's no elytral locking mechanism and that the lateral margins of the elytra are explanate or pointed outwards, and they do not fold down 
They do not form epipleury. The subelytral space is exposed. These beetles could not regulate water as well as extant beetles. We're going to ignore short elytra things for that statement. This is something that we should focus on in the future. For now, I want to point out conceptually something that's very important for the rest of the talk, which is that I'm going to be talking about stem groups and crown groups. These are living species. They share an ancestor descendant relationship to the uh, ancestor, uh, which we can call the crown clade most recent common ancestor. Here's an extinct group. We can call this a stem group because it's outside of the crown. The stem group, which is extinct again, has a most recent common ancestor with the crown group, but we would call this the most recent common ancestor of the total clade. All right, why is this significant? Because Jakarta coelidae are very reasonably well supported based on all of the evidence, sister to all other coleoptera. Then there's another lineage that is sister to the remainder of the coleoptera. Then we've got the crown coleoptera, which have been dubbed the metacoleoptera. If we take a parsimony approach to the evolution of the coleoptera and their phylogeny uh, using morphology only, so I mean, that's the only evidence available for the fossils, we would end up having Archistomata as sister to all other living beetles, and we would have what I called the rat families in reference to the 80s hairband. Um, I could have called them the tart, I decided not. <laughs> what I want to point out is that here's a cute little Archistobatum. You can see those window punctures. There's a couple of other things. But what I want to point out more importantly is that having a tuberculate cuticle, so tubercles on the head, a couple of other things, the synapomorphia of beetles, an exposed uh, trochantin, um, complex musculature, this is all present in the ancestor of all beetles, and it's reduced in what would be the core clade of coleoptera if we assume that Archistomata are sister to everyone else. But when we constrain the phylogeny of beetles, given the most recent phylogenomic results, we end up having the rat families as sister to the remainder of the group. And importantly, we have the, core, the crown clade of beetles being smooth, having concealed trochantin, and having simplified muscul musculature with a regain inside of Archistomata and then a re-loss and re-smoothing in the Archistomata itself. So if we put this on a tree to simplify it, because I know that that was a very busy figure, this is the, the parsimonious perspective on beetle phylogeny. We've got a Jakarta coelidae, Hermocupetidae, the rat families, Archistomata, the, uh, the sclerite is lost, the muscles are lost, in this clade, but that's not the case. Archistomata are well nested inside of the coleoptera, and this sclerite and its musculature could be lost with a total regain, including the musculature, inside of the archistomata with an additional loss, or we have multiple parallel losses. But the bottom line is that neither of those circumstances are parsimonious. And if we take a look at an independent character system, in this case, male genitalia, which for the purpose of this particular audience, I would say tardigrades have a cloaca and it's not that interesting. Um, <laughs> male genitalia on the top row show hymenoptera, raphidioptera, diptera, the bottom row are various beetles. Uh, you'll, you know, I, so here's where I promised people I would pantomime. So I'm gonna pantomime and go to the front here. So starting with the hymenoptera, we've got outer graspers, uh, we've got inner grippers, and then we've got the ediagus or the phallus or the penis, whatever you want to call it. The most important thing here is this thing, LPE. This is the lateral penite. This is an odd apomorphy of the holometabola and has very important consequences for the interpretation of the homologies of genitalia. But that's for another story. But basically, we can see that here, gripping. We can see that here in diptera, gripping. We can see that here in archistomata gripping, clasping, anchoring, absent in the diticity, adophaga, absent in polyphaga, absent in mixophaga. I just didn't want to clutter the screen by showing that. Here, just to give it a visual punctuation, laterapenites present in other holometabola, present in archistomata, absent in polyphaga, adophaga, mixophaga. So what does that mean? It means that if we took a parsimonious approach or view of the evolution of this, we would have a lateral penite gained in the ancestor of the whole metabola, and then a loss 
in polyphaga, you know, the ancestor of this smooth group. But that can't be the case. It's either the lateral penite and its muscles were lost in the ancestor of the beetles and totally regained, or it's been lost multiple times. So given the robust phylogenomic results, the evolution of the Coleoptera is not parsimonious, whether you prefer the loss scenario or the gain scenario, because you end up with gain, loss, gain. So we need to think about other models and we need to think about the anatomy and the morphology itself, and importantly, the function. So LP here is lateral penine presence and then gripping because that's what they do. I mean, literally it is an opposable digit. They grasp things between this lateral penite and a solid structure that isn't moving. So we can have a, this is what I would suggest as a base model that we could test one day using, you know, statistical methods that we lose the lateral penite because we gain penial torsion. It wouldn't be very good if you gripped onto the female and then your genitalia underwent torsion because you might lose your genitalia. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the gain of the sperm pump and the sperm pump is also associated with the absence of the lateral penite. So maybe by gaining a sperm pump, you're less likely to need the gripping. But we also have a clamping function that's been emphasized at least in some polyphaga by those outer claspers. Maybe that's enough. Maybe there's other features involved with the base of those um, that reduce the need for gripping. And then we have clasping. So what I would propose would be a model of you, you go for, it's basically, I would call it like uh, a wobbly stepping stone. Starting from the ancestral state, you could go forward, but you can't go back. You can only go forward from there. Um, and so I'd suggest that there would be no reversals and that there would be other patterns, but we're not here to test that today. And in fact, I want to emphasize this particular render of these genitalia because this is not something I did by hand. Uh, this is completely in the computer. And this is where I want to introduce to you um, the idea if, of phenomics or big data for morphology. And I want to say this, and, 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 and I will probably say this multiple times, but it's happening now. We are transitioning to a phenomic approach to insect morphology and anatomy. In direct analogy to uh, genomics, where you go from genotype to sequencing to genome, we're going from phenotype to scanning to phenome. There's lots of other modes of sampling phenotypes, but scanning is very important and you'll see why. Scanning or X-ray microcomputed tomography, so the use of X-rays, like if you're in a hospital, is very simple in principle. You have your specimen, you have an X-ray source and you have a detector. You turn on the X-ray, you turn off the X-ray, you rotate the specimen, turn on, turn off, rotate. You repeat this through a full 360 degrees of rotation for 2,000 plus projections. You end up with a series of vertical projections through the body of the animal with the beam, the X-ray being attenuated by the variable density of the body and using basically some fancy math that we don't even need to think about at this point, we end up reconstructing um, cross sections. So from a vertical frontal thing to cross sections, and we end up with a stack of these, which are called tomograms. And from this stack, we can then construct three-dimensional models, three-dimensional surface models, like this cute little ant here, I love Cipomermex, uh, to volume models. So here we pulled out all of the muscles of the abdomen of an ant. Um, and then we can use this for downstream things. We can use this for diagnostics, for systematics, for phylogenetic modeling. We can use this, whoops, the, the morphospace didn't show up, sadly. Anyway, we can use this for quantifying morphospace evolution, the rate of morphological evolution, for example, and also to do finite element analysis or other the, the application of other engineering methods to understand biomechanically why shapes are the way they are in insects and to test hypotheses explicitly because these are quantitative and they're replicable. Um, and then finally, for I think most of our purposes, um, when we scan something, we get a full digital model and we can make this into effectively a cyber type. So every single specimen we scan here, so these are irreplaceable holotypes of some very cute ants called Discothyria. We have a three-dimensional model that anyone on earth can access. There's small files, you can rotate them, anything you want to do with them, morphometrics, 
character discovery. We can do this with specimens that are 100 years old, 300 years old, doesn't matter. We can do it, we can do it now. And now I want to apply this technology to fossils. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of related case studies. And all of these case studies are related to this ant genus Gerontophermica. It's a stem ant. It is definitively not a living, if any descendant of any living ant group has a series of plesiomorphic features. And these Gerontophermica are 100 million years old, which puts them 200 million years after that Chicarda coelid beetle. Um, oh shoot, I forgot that I was gonna show you guys Adrian and Shulio, my two close friends who I did this work with. Uh, Adrian's in Japan now, Shulio's in Brazil at Pizoza. This single amber fossil has done more than any natural history item I've ever examined to change the way that I think about ant evolution. We can see that this amber piece, which is you know about in the middle of the Cretaceous, early, late Cretaceous, exactly right between the two. Um, it has three adult ants, a cute little beetle, some schmutz, a little bit of plant material, and a pupa. And you can see the pupa has a cocoon. So we take a closer look, we can see, ah, it's difficult to see the pupa. We can see some various things of these ants. It's pretty nice. Um, Julio and I applied some standard photographic methods, fluorescent microscopy, but very importantly, we were able to micro CT scan all of these specimens, which allowed us to do character discovery. So we were able to examine every single labial and maxillary palpamere in detail, side by side, which allowed us to find that there is a really cool synapomorphy for a subplate of these ants, uh, this little lobe here. But I think kind of more importantly, we can actually make renders of conventional views that we're used to thinking about. And so here's for the pupa, one of the species, a second species. I know there are two species because I compared all of these. And importantly, because I was able to compare all of these and take measurements that I trusted down to the micron scale, okay, recognizing that there's a an amount of warping that happens over 100 million years, um, I was able to uh, reasonably sort out this species from the other species, and this informed my revision of the genus. I recognized three species groups. I was able to define a new species and recognize, importantly, that most of this, you know, like half of the species in this genus are not actually identifiable at all. Like we can't even particularly tell that they would belong to this genus. I think that's really significant. And that wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have scans that allowed me to take a really close look and understand what it means to be one of these ants structurally. Now I wanna talk about what the implications of these ants are for the social biology of ants in general. That's where this pupa comes in handy. You can see again that we can't see very much. Um, the stem ants are extremely diverse. There's some scary cinnabites. Um, there's monsters, uh, like you wake up screaming in the middle of the night. And then there's also some relatively plain stem ants. And in fact, we have a really good sense of which of these is actually sister to the living ants, but that's besides the point. What's important is that it's relatively easy to sort these out into three reasonably monophyletic subfamilies, Speckomermine, Zagrasomyziani, and Hatomermycini. There's been fossil evidence that from these, um, from these uh, lineages, which are all from the mid Cretaceous up to about 70 million years ago, that people have used to claim that ants were eusocial, were complex in their social behavior very early on. And this was that sometimes more than one individual was found in a single piece of amber, there was aggregations. And for some, we know that there have been found females that are winged and females that are wingless that these winged and wingless females have never been found in the same piece of amber, and I'll return to that. Importantly, I want to point out something that I think we're all thinking, which is that non-social aggregation is exceedingly common. Here's a bunch of primary larvae of a beetle. Not complex, not eusocial, not doing anything fancy behaviorally besides being born. Uh, here's one of these stem ants uh, predating. Is this ant bringing anything back to a nest and feeding young of their sisters? No way on earth you can infer that from this single fossil. And then here's two ants ripping each other to pieces before they died 100 million years ago. And I would gently submit that conflict is the opposite of cooperation. 
Meaning that I don't think that we've got any reasonable fossil evidence right now that these stem lineages were actually social. We're doing anything altruistic or cooperative with one another. So what evidence do we have from ex extant or living lineages? Here's a simplified phylogeny of the Hymenoptera down to superfamily level. If we look at the occurrence of uh, sexual wing dimorphism, so females without wings, that's evolved even in sawflies. If we look at our favorite character, which is wing wingless polyphenism in females, of which you know we would think would define ants, it turns out that's evolved even in ichneumonoidia and even in chalcidoidia and even in methylity. So no, it's not necessary and sufficient. Maybe it's necessary, but if we think about other hymenoptera that are used social, no. So this is not exactly evidence for complex social organization, which is where this pupa comes back in. Because we were able to scan this pupa and compare it to the other species in this piece of amber, it was reasonably, I, I'm reasonably confident that this pupa belongs to that worker. There's a series of features that are unique to these guys compared to other ants in that piece of amber and in the genus as a whole. So that raises the question, how did that pupa end up in a resin flow 100 million years ago? Was it ant-ant predation? Ant people would probably be going, oh, well, when we think about ant-ant predation, you need some kind of complex social organization to take on individuals guarding a nest. So that kind of a priori would mean that there's some amount of cooperation going on. Okay, what about delosis or kidnapping? I mean, you know, the polyergus, the other ants that go and raid other nests, kill the, you know, the, the guards, bring the young back, raise them as their own. Um, that would also imply a priori complex social behavior. What about an accident? This ant, this, this pupa is not jumping, it's not walking, and it can't fly. It didn't get in here like purely by chance, I don't think, you know, this, this piece of amber is relatively clear. It's not one of these dirty dirt specimens that, you know, you can see that it captured most of the dirt around it. Termite fossils tend to be like that. So that kind of actually leaves root transport. This individual or another individual not preserved in this piece of amber may have picked up and dropped this pupa. And that actually polarized something to me that I had missed for a long time. In fact, we had missed when considering the definition of ants, which is that it turns out that brood transport is a behavioral autapomorphy of ants. It's totally unique among ants. Maybe there's another hymenopteran that does it, but certainly none of the complex social hymenoptera, we're talking vespids, bees, they don't pick up their brood and put them down. Ants do that as a matter of daily life, um, unless you're a fungus growing ant in which you're your ant is in a fungus, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. What's important is that because that this ant could have been dropped because of brood transport, which is a strong behavioral autapomorphy for ants, that kind of snaps everything into place. This could be called nursing behavior. These, this could be called a queen, this could be called a worker, and this could reasonably be foraging. But for the first time we have some I would say more direct evidence of cooperation. So this I think uh, brings me to the last part of the Gerontophermica section. Uh, this was also done with Adrian, but also my spiritual advisor in Germany, Rolf Beutel, with a random Italian cat. Um, so because we scanned these ants, uh, because we scanned this fossil ant, we're able to do what we call a digital dissection. We were able to separate all the mouth parts. We we're able to separate out the, the endoskeleton of the head, the tentorium. We we're able to view the inside of the head uh, like that, for example. Um, but then also, very importantly, we were able to make consistent uh, renders of this ant relative to non-ant hymenoptera and to ants. And using this, we were able to make micron scale comparisons. So a thousandth of a millimeter comparison between this 100 million year old ant, living ants and other groups. And we observe a bunch of things. We observe uh, the frontal carina is present. Uh, that's a defining feature of ants. It appears to have also evolved in other hymenoptera. Okay, we see that the compound eyes are situated posteriorly and that they're small. 
Well, small compound eyes in wingless females is not anything particularly special, but because we can now look at the nervous systems comparatively, these guys that have the anterior eyes, their, their, their ocular nerves do this weird curve. Is that ancestral? Okay, we can talk about it. There's a number of other things. What's far more exciting to me is that because we can do a digital dissection, we can rip out the mouth parts in the computer of this 100 million year old fossil and compare it to these guys and look at complex structures that literally there were not concepts for before we started thinking about this. Um, and it turns out that there's an incredible amount of variation in the oral, in the sclerite, that's a region that surrounds the oral cavity. I'm going to, for the sake of simplicity, elide the details, but I will point out something that gave me great pleasure. Like Adrian and I, one day in the museum went, oh my God, turns out why, I don't know, but ants, including this fossil, are uniquely defined, at least as far as we know, among the hymenoptera, by having a bulge between the antennal toruli, the antennal sockets. We're calling that the frontal bulge. Why? No idea. That was kind of cool, though. <laughs> but I think what's even cooler is that, so yeah, we found a synapomorphy, that's neat. But we were also able to digitally dissect out the antenna and look at the antennal rim in great detail, which revealed some things. But I think the most exciting thing, in a way, is that that middle frame here, that's the antennal socket. This is the inside of the head of that 100 million year old ant. That ant is fingernail to fingernail size here. We're looking out of the socket of the antenna of the inside of the head of that. And not only does this allow us to compare it to the living non ant, you know, uh, hymenopterid, we see a lot of very interesting variation there, but it allows us to polarize a feature that we newly observe that we love to death. Here's the socket, there's this lobe, a lobe, a lobe, absent, absent. This, what we're calling um, torular apodeme, is unique to a clade of ants that excludes the leptanolines. It's a small little lineage. They're sister to the remainder of the ants. Um, they're alive today. The example is in the top right. But why on earth? We have no idea. But what we were able to do is generate about 160 to 170 characters. Um, canonically in ant uh, morphology, there's been about 80 characters of the head that have been used for phylogeny and classification. We doubled that and stopped because we wanted more specimens and we kind of at some point were pulling out our hair because we could have kept going. Um, we plotted these on a phylogeny, yes, using parsimony, but also Bayesian methods. It kind of doesn't matter. We had an a priori phylogeny um, and the, we discovered a series of odd apomorphies that are unique to the total plate of ants. Uh, seven synapomorphies or odd apomorphies of ants themselves and a series of things within the ants. And most of these are new. I mean, so every time we look at something using micro CT scanning, we're able to see an order of magnitude more than we were before. And this is not a one-off. I also want to point out that <coughs> because we were able to digitally dissect out the mouth parts, we, will, we were able to compare areas that have been historically like virtually impossible to get a reasonable view of Here's the underside of the mandible of that Geronta formica and a formica, a living ant and a mid-Cretaceous ant. And we were able to recognize a series of homologous features that, again, did not have any concepts. Like, we had to find the, 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 the concepts and the words for these. And because we were able to recognize these, we were able to posit two new hypotheses for the origin of the triangular or shovel-shaped mandible, which is argued by Ed Wilson, for example, Leo Wilson, to be one of the quote unquote innovations, key innovations of the crown ants. And we're also able to talk about this in greater detail. I will again elide those details. I'll also point out though, that we're able to think about this developmentally and set up, or at least explain in the paper, what are the basic ideas that should be tested by evolutionary developmental biologists using molecular methods to break their animals' development. So that brings me to the last part of my talk, 
which is about applying um, micro CT scanning and just the phenomic approach to living species. I divide this into two chunks. Uh, so the first is on the prosternum of the hymenoptera, and the second is on the locomotion of the hymenoptera. So this is work that I did with uh, my grad student, Aurier de Mera in Sao Paulo, and as well, Dr. Matt. Um, <laughs> thank you, Matt. And uh, so if we take a look at this beautiful Formica rufa, and we see that this ant, you know, the mesosoma, no wings, we can recognize reasonably subregions of the thorax, the mesosoma, that's fine. We flip it over though, and we see that there's the paired propluri, uh, and then the procoxy, I ripped one out. Uh, we ripped one out for demonstration purposes. We see this sclerite in between. This is the prosternum, which is a separate sclerite. Okay, so I'm going to take a little diversion here and talk about little scanning and big scanning. So little scanning would be conventional scanning. We can do this in the museum here. Easy, 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 easy. We can scan specimens 100 years old, get soft tissues out of them. It's amazing. Big scanning is synchrotron scanning. Synchrotron scanning, uh, basically there's a, an engine that produces a stream of electrons that are loaded into a vacuum and they're spinning in this storage ring at just below the speed of light. Eventually using magnets, they're sucked out into a larger ring. This larger ring can be anywhere from 100 meters in diameter to five kilometers in diameter. And the electrons are shooting around with their, 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 their path, they, they become synchronized by the use of arrays of magnets. And the quality of the beam is modified by these magnets. And one set of these magnets actually shunts a series of these electrons out, which due to the conservation of angular momentum shoot out in an exactly straight line. Then we use one last batch of magnets to slow the electrons down which causes breaking radiation. So basically they produce very high power X-rays that can be used in many different applications. I will point out very briefly that a synchrotron has the electrons moving in synchrony around a ring, whereas a cyclotron starts the electrons at a point and they spiral <laughs> and then leave. So the synchrotron can store energy. So I, this was special for you guys, okay? I, 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 this, these are photos from the inside of a synchrotron. So here is one of those linear accelerators. They've got the bricks, so that way the radiation doesn't shoot backwards. The electrons are shot through here. Here's one of the examples of the magnets I'm talking about. So this is a, a brick of magnets about that big. This is a, a set of tripole magnets. So one, two, three sets of magnets. Um, and then I'm trying something that I'm not used to doing. We're going to look on the inside of one of the storage ring halls. It's a bit of a fast video. If it works. Oh, we can post it in conjunction with your talk. Yeah, I had a feeling it wasn't going to work. Oh, well, I was basically just going to show you that the hall goes down one way very far with magnets, goes down very far to the disappearing point the other way with magnets. Um, here's what the, the other end looks like. So this is where the, the x-rays come out, uh, warning x-rays. Here's an extremely large piece of amber. Here's the x-ray source. It comes out, it passes through, hits a detector, which then um, using crystals basically bends the beam until it can be magnified and hit a camera objective, which then record, you know, I don't know, it can be thousands of times in a second, basically, shooting that into a computer terminal. Um, here's another video. Oh, that one works. So because it's a very high power uh, X-ray beam, you have to do a search every time you turn on the beam, so that way no one gets, you know, I don't know, 50, like, I don't know. I, I'm not, I think, units of X-ray. You don't want it in your head. Let's put it that way. Big, big door. <laughs> That's joy. Well, oh, that is joy and music to my ears. So for everything that I try to do, um, I take a node spanning approach. So given our best current phylogenetic um, hypothesis, 
um, I try to take samples that span the nodes. So here we've got <clears throat> one daughter lineage and another daughter lineage and their ancestor. I tried to sample these. I sampled that one. We get information about that ancestor. Repeat, we get this ancestor, but we don't know if any derivations from this ancestor to that ancestor, we don't know where that happened. It could have happened at this ancestor, that one, or at other nodes that we don't have data for, which is why we try to be as total as possible in our sampling given our present phylogenetic knowledge. So we ended up scanning um, about a thousand something species of Hymenopterus spanning most of the superfamilies, which gives us a reasonable estimate for the backbone nodes of phylogeny. Uh, if we take a look at the three-dimensional model of the inside of the ant, we've got the head here, the propleuron with its little like cervical sclerite. The cervical sclerites of Hymenoptera are usually fused to the propleuron if that's... Um, and then we've got here the meso and the meta uh, sternal elements, which are immovably fused to their segments, whereas the prosternum is free and very complex and bears a minimum of eight muscles, uh, but up to 15 muscles and sometimes extra muscles. It's very interesting. But a series of these muscles are involved in controlling the motion of the head. Uh, a pair of these are involved in controlling the motion of the pleury, which also control the motion of the head. I can go into greater detail about this if you want. Um, there's also muscles that control, a whole series of muscles that control the four coxae and even a muscle that goes through the coxa to the trochanter that lifts the trochanter and then there's a pair of stabilizing muscles. Actually having a pair of stabilizing muscles is a special hymenopteran thing. We're not gonna worry about that too much. For the sake of illustration, I just wanna show you a few examples. On the top row is a nice ant. On the bottom row is a nice sawfly. We see that there's abundant differences. And then we look, like, we look at a cecodium. And then we look at a beetle and we see stunning, stunning differences in these, and we're not even thinking about the muscles or the functions or anything at this point. If we put them side by side, we see that, I mean, you know, you, you can kind of initially get a sense of what part may be homologous to what part, but it took us a long time of comparison to figure out what really is going on. Um, I want to point out that the apocrita are extremely distinct from the sawflies, and they're, they occupy their own morphospace. But more importantly, I want to point out that the Hymenoptera are, we found that the Hymenoptera are uniquely identified among the holometabola and among insects in general and having a modification of the prosternum that replaces one of the coxal articulations. So the coxae of many groups of insects have a lateral plural articulation and then a more of an anterior articulation with what's called the protrochantin. That's reduced in Hymenoptera, and in the sawflies, it's replaced by a series of little bumpers. These little bumpers become separate sclerites, which I've highlighted here in this erusive. And if we take a look uh, at the cross-section, we can see that these little bumpers, these lateral sternites, actually fit into the groove of the coxa, modulating the motion. What does that mean in terms of Hymenoptera and locomotion? What does it mean that these are lost in the apocrypha. I want to know, and I've got preliminary data. And this is work that I did with um, my really good friend, Tony Verl at the Friedrich Schiller University of Vienna. He's got his PhD hat, his Dr. Hoot, um, and then his student, Vincent Regular. Um, what we did was that we took a high frame rate camera, thousand something frames a second. Uh, Tony, uh, using Legos in his garden house, built this high-tech uh, kinematic chamber for Hymenoptera. So basically, plexiglass Legos, um, and you, you drop the insect in there, and it goes back and forth. And importantly, here's an array of prisms. Light goes in, bounces off the back, goes up. Uh, because we have this array of prisms below the floor, and because the floor is plexiglass, that allows us to get simultaneous lateral and ventral views of these ants, which means that we don't need two cameras. We need one camera, and using this single camera, we can take 10 seconds of footage, which is a lot of frames, mark all of the body points, track these independently. We can track the height of the knees relative to the thorax, on and on. 
We then translate these into variables of interest. Uh, this is basically a, a gate pattern. This is a traditional approach to quantifying when an animal is stepping and when it's lifting. Black is uh, planted, white is lifted. Uh, L1, L2, L3, uh, the left legs, R1, R2, R3, right legs. Um, if L, L1 and L2 are white and black, that means one is down and one is up. So we can see in our head the alternating and if we take a look at it any single time slice like here, we can see that there would be three feet on the ground, which is why we would call this a tetrapodal gate. Um, we then also extracted other variables, which I didn't want to feel like, I didn't feel like translating from German. Um, and so we quantified the shape of the triangle made by the feet. We quantified the maximum forward position, maximum posterior position, of the legs during any stroke cycle, which allowed us to calculate the angle, the minimum and the maximum angle for the range of motion of each leg. We're, we summarized our data in a number of ways. I like this one a lot. Vincent's did a wonderful job. At the top, we have a sawfly, a braconid, a vespid, and then an ant. Uh, these are what we call the Schnee angle winkel, which is the snow angel angles. <laughs> um, yeah, and, so, and then and these are all scaled to body length. Then we've got the tri the, the triangles of the gate uh, scaled to body length, and then the step patterns scaled to one second. Uh, I want to point out here that when we look at the soft fly, we can see that maybe the hind leg is reaching pretty far relative to other legs. Um, but the most important thing that I actually want to point out is not only were these really slow, but actually, when we look at any one moment in time, usually there's four, sometimes five, sometimes six feet on the ground. These basically never gained a tripod locomotion. The soft flies in our data set were not walking tripod. They also appeared to have a bit of a difference in terms of the range of motion of their foreleg. But for now, we should consider this suggestive evidence that soft flies are doing something different. And I emphasize again, the laterosternal sclerite that modifies the articulation is gone in the apocrypha. Okay, and then of course, it's I, I gotta talk about ants. Mm -hmm. Here's the ant. We can see the ant reaches its hind leg very far, its mid leg very out. Um, one thing you'll notice, one step cycle is very short. Okay, so we're gonna think about here a couple of variables that describe the rate of motion, and I promise we're almost done. Uh, this is the absolute duty factor, which describes the amount of time that a leg is on the ground holding load. Um, and basically, we see that kind of on average, ants are not actually doing anything particularly special. This is not a statistically significant difference. Um, but if we look at the total length of the stride from step to lift to step to lift um, and scale that to body size, so from a very small cynipid, for example, to a really, really large Vespa, um, ants had proportionally very long steps, statistically significantly so. And indeed, when we scaled the velocity of these guys, so we had tiny cynipoids, they were kind of bumbly, they weren't, weren't very good at walking, to very big Vespa, and the Vespa were moving fast and they were scary. Well, when we scaled that to body size to control, for body size to body length, I should say, all other hymenoptera were at most going almost five body lengths a second. The ants that went that slow, we accidentally hurt. <laughs> um, ants were st statistically fast. So how fast, you might ask? Well, I present to you the fastest human on Earth. Uh, this is Usain Bolt. His body length is about 1.96 meters. Uh, his maximum recorded speed in competition is 12.42 meters a second. He's going six and a third body lengths a second. Okay, then we have a cheetah. We know cheetahs are fast. Cheetahs go about 60 miles an hour. We know, okay. But, you know, body length about a, a meter and a half. Maximum speed about... 33 and a third meters, you know, got to be a little bit round here. We don't want to go into the cheetah speed, you know, like record literature here. What I do want to point out is that really their maximum speed is about 22 body lengths a second, which is blazing. And then we have an ant from 1.6 to 12 millimeters, walking speed 26 to 70 millimeters, five 
to 20 body lengths a second. Your average boring ant on your counter is going cheetah speeds, and she's <laughs> probably having an off day. <laughs> and we're not even talking about the fastest ants. Cataglyphus have been recorded going half a meter a second. All right. <laughs> so um, the take home message is that ants are fast. <laughs> so, um, all right, I get to conclude now. So what I've tried to do is bring us from the very end of the Carboniferous to basically the other day, um, <clears throat> using different approaches. Um, and all of this threaded through morphology, morphological theory, systematics, taxonomy, everything went into this. Um, and I would summarize these as, for example, the evolution of Hymenoptera is not parsimonious. It's, it's really hard to wrap your head around the evolution of complex physical, mechanical, functional structures in the bees. Um, phenomics, so micro CT scanning, is really useful for fossils, but also to me, importantly, complex social behavior evolved well before the ancestor of the living ants, but in the ancestor of those ants, but you know, more total. Um, the hymenoptera are defined by a novel leg articulation, um, and that's lost in the apocrypha. And uh, soft, soft flies may be tetrapodal, maybe not. We need a lot more data, but ants are fast. Not all of them, obviously, but darn, they're fast. Okay, with that, I will um, thank my, my co-advisors here at the Smithsonian. I'm super grateful to Matt Buffington and Ted Schultz. Uh, to my advisors in Germany, uh, Rolf Beutel and Hans Pohl, and I've got a lot of people to thank here. Mike, Bob, Yovana, Yona, Hannah, Scott, Tom Nguyen, um, a bunch of nerds who I really, really appreciate, and then my friends at the Fuletisches Museum in Jena. As was mentioned, I'm moving to Frankfurt uh, with Jill on January 8th. I'm going to be Hymenoptera curator and group leader there. So if you want to stop by Frankfurt, look at some cool stuff, maybe zap some bugs, do something, um, I would be super happy to facilitate that. Um, and I have one more thing. This fossil, these ants, 100 million years old, scan their heads, this is what it looks like. They got schmutz. <laughs> <laughs> That's not schmutz. That's the three-dimensionally preserved internal soft tissue of this ant, from the gland uh, to the salivary canal, to tiny muscles, to big muscles, to the last thing it was grooming off of itself before it died, its pharyngeal tract, its nervous system, the musculature was preserved down to individual muscle cross striations. And when we look a little bit further, we were able to actually identify all of the subregions of the brain. And if we look at that cross section in A, uh, which is the olfactory glomerulus, that's preserved down to the cellular level. So we're able to count all of the olfactory glomeruli, um, which we presume is significant for sensory, you know, neuromotor things in these fossils. Certainly it's necessary for extant ants to function socially, but this is out of my hands. We've let the data go and we'll see what people do. So with that, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Great talk, first of all. Uh, a couple things, curious about, um, well, I want to get back to the first and last, or almost last thing, penultimate thing you mentioned about uh, hymenoptera and coleoptera, uh, not the parsimony thing, but the fact there's a gap between when you're supposed to see hymenoptera fossils and when you do see hymenoptera fossils. So we found the same things with winged insects, which is, which, but it's not exactly the same situation. Mm. When, you know, people uh, have, um, applied time calibrated phylogenetic tests to insects, they find that sure enough, winged insects appear in the Devonian or Silurian 100 million years before any fossils of winged insects occur, 80 million years before any fossils of winged insects occur. And we think that's an, uh, an analytical artifact, okay? Because <laughs> beast does weird stuff and most people don't, actually nobody really understands. But in this case, uh, but that wasn't a question of topology. 
and nobody was worried about the topology there. In this case, you've got an incongruence between the topology and the fossil record. So are you saying that, my question is, is the ordinal phylogeny of insects off to the point where beetles are primitive with respect to hives? Mm -hmm. Or is something else going on? And don't, I'm not talking about people missing fossils or yeah. you know, any of that. Right, so um, he asked me uh, that, that fossil record uh, information for beetles, just what does that imply for the evolution of the whole of a tabula or perhaps broader? Um, I would say that what this implies most starkly is that there's no problem per se with, for example, Misov at all. Uh, we can, oh, there's many problems with Misov. It's well, terrible. But don't worry about that. We're, I mean, we, can, we cannot worry about, you know, whatever, you know, approximate topology we want to take from that. Hymenopter being sister to right, the right. whole metabola. That there's no problem from the fossil record there. What there is, though, is a very, 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 very clear bias in the fossil record to beetles um, versus soft body things. Um, so these beetles that we do have preserved, they are still relatively hard, but they're not all elytra that, that uh, Jakarta coelid was a whole body. I'm not totally sure why beetles are preserving so well, but we would infer that beetles should, you know, the beetles like going back to Strepsipter and then back to, you know, the Neuropterida, sure. um, their fossil re record should, should extend into the Carboniferous. And likewise, Hymenoptera should go from the Carboniferous through the Permian through to that first hind fossil. We just have a totally gross bias. So, I mean, because what's interesting is, I mean, the same kind of thing is presumed to have happened in Lepidoptera, which fossilized very crappily. Mm -hmm. Okay, really, 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 really poor fossil record. Okay, mm -hmm. um, but are you, so you're saying that um, you think the, you're not questioning the the position of Hymenoptera, mm -hmm. um, but you're saying that there's a big gap. Where fossils, where they've just evaded fossilization, because mm -hmm. that's that's a that's a big gap. Yeah, and that's I mean that's kind of like we looked at that and and it's like we couldn't really. I mean that that's been sort of part of the argument of why no fossil inkwad, we're not why no fossil winged insects at all before the Carboniferous, right? Um, but I mean it's it's hard to imagine that they would have all evaded. Fossilization. I don't. I don't question the phylogeny either. By the way. Yeah. But, but it seems like I don't. In this case, I don't see another explanation. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just so fascinating because you know to emphasize again that first fossil hymenopter. I mean, there's one arguably from the Carboniferous, but it it, it could be a Sicodian, and it's just a fragment of the wing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and we're yeah. The homology interpretations are. Uh, they're over-interpreted, let's just put it that way. But like when it comes to an actual hymenopteran, that's the early late Triassic. We have all of the, the uh, suborders of Coleoptera being preserved by then. We have evidence of Adaphaga and Polyphaga and probably even Mixophaga, at least stem groups of these guys at around the end Permian. And then we've got this broad smear of Archostomatin things, uh, the, the, the rat, um, the rat group uh, into the mid Permian. And then we've got those weird Jakardos and Permo uh, Cupetids. And those guys very clearly show a morphological, it's a step currently because we don't have the intermediate lineages, but a beautiful stepwise transition series to the crown beetles. And because there's 400 plus fossils dating from the very beginning of the Permian, very clearly beetle, totally strongly supported, Odd apomorphies, synapomorphies, analysis. We've, we've really thought about it. There should be other groups that are just not being preserved. Or if they are being preserved, people who are cracking the rocks are not going, that's cool. That could be something. To or they're just bits and pieces. Yeah. About your image, the one that's being covered up by that. Just... Yeah. Okay. Those are captured in amber, correct? Yes. Would you see that? What would you see with a dried specimen? What would you see with a living specimen? 
what would you see with other types of fossils? Yeah, so um, his question was, what would we see externally um, from this specimen uh, given its preservation? And I think uh, I, can, I can both verbally explain that, which is to say not much, um, and then uh, visually show it in a little bit more detail. Um, they kind of just look like the regular exoskeleton of the insect. We couldn't really tell, for example, that it was darker or translucent. We could, at this point, we don't know what indicates preserva internal preservation external. Some specimens we can totally tell um, are hollow, like you just see straight through them. We, we tried to scan a fossil at time here that was so translucent it looked like a little ghost. We got really nice data from the synchrotron. Um, but these basically just look like regular ants. And you can see here a little bit of paleo fungus. So the insides of the gaster were digested out. So we didn't see anything, but yeah. So related to imaging, the synchrotron gives you what compared to the micro CT? And how does that compare with alternate methods like magnetic resonance microscopy or ultrasound? Why did you pick what you picked for the experts? Sure. Um, so I'm going to summarize that question. What's special about synchrotron relative to conventional scanner uh, scanning and what other methods um, could be used and why not use them for this particular circumstance? What's extremely special about the synchrotron is that these are uh, federally funded um, physics experiments, and they are extremely powerful. So even when we attenuate the beam, um, the, 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 the power from this beam um, is so profound that like we can actually put the specimen almost a meter back, which allows the wavelengths to pass through the specimen actually interfere with itself, giving us phase contrast. Whereas for our scanner here, um, you have to jam the specimen as close as possible to the source, and you still don't really get a decent signal for the specimen on the inside. So it's a matter of power. And um, a colleague of mine uh, in France did actually turn the power up just to see how far it could go. He didn't hit the red stop button and the piece of amber exploded. I don't remember <laughs> what that was, um, but we just decided not to go that far. Um, but yeah, so why not other methods? So Photography gives us a certain amount of information, especially nice hairs and things. Um, confocal, laser scanning microscopy, not particularly well suited, I would say, for amber because it's already fluorescent. Um, the fluorescent green light of microscopy, though, is really useful. It gives a great visual contrast. Um, NMR, uh, uh, ultrasound, I just those aren't tuned per se to creating images at the micron scale of animals. I would say that's the easiest answer there. The advantage of all of these methods, conventional or synchrotron, is that you get micron scale pixels in volumes that you then, they're quantitative, and then you can do basically anything you want with them provided you've got signal. So that's the answer in a nutshell. Ms. <coughs> Jensen? Uh just to confirm what Brendan is saying as a microscopist, you're always limited by the half wavelength of whatever your emitter is. And with x-rays, the half wavelength is, is like an order of magnitude shorter than with regular light or ultrasound. So the resolution is substantially finer. And with the synchrotron, power is so much greater that you can do things like structured illumination. And that's what gives you the phase contrast that you're talking about. You put gratings in front of it which can give you even better resolution and also finer contrast um, when you consider like what the what the x-ray is passing through. Usually with biological samples, the material is, you know, there's not a lot of difference chemically between the amber, you know, when you're talking about like composition in terms of atomic, atomic structure, like amber is made of carbon, the insect is made of carbon, right, with some hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Telling the difference between those in terms of density is very difficult in a microscopic setting. But with X-rays, if you're able to use structured illumination, it's very easy to tell that difference because you have such high energies involved and such short wavelengths. So that's a 
that's part of it. Um, so he's right about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so on the fossilization thing, so point out that beetles tend to preserve better. I know their cuticles kind of unique. Were you ever able to like see substructure in those? I don't know if the fossils are fine enough and just film. Um, so uh, he asked, uh, have I been able to tell anything about the actual material of the cuticle of the fossil beetles? Um, I have not applied myself any of these technologies yet to beetles. Um, so I have no evidence currently. In trilobites, sometimes you can see layering structure, but it's very rare. I just, yeah, I wanted to see if there's anything. Can we see a picture of those, the LPEs again? There was one thing that I... The LPE? Yeah. Which LPE? The lateral, lateral P, with the beetles. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 gotcha. Lateropedon or whatever it's... Oh, wrong way. There it is. Oh, ladder of penites. Yeah. Ladder of penites, that's the one. So I'm looking at those ladder of penites. Yeah. And I'm thinking, in those top three examples, what direction are they facing? It looks like they're kind of facing toward the toward the uh, posterior, right? Yeah. Then in that arpistomata, yeah. they're recurved. Uh yeah. Am I, am I seeing that right? Am I focusing on the right structure? Yes. So uh, he asked for a structural clarification um, about the, the orientation of the lateral penites in the arcus domain. Here's one. Here's the part uh, that it grips to. Here's the other, and there's the part it grips to. You can see that this one's in a different orientation. These are controlled by a large fan muscle, and I'm not sure currently whether or not that muscle is divided into two fascicles, but basically one of these uh, in preservation was oriented differently. I'm really curious about the homology assessments in those muscles, and if, especially in the intermediate groups um, in the polyphaga and adephaga, the whether they have those same muscles at all, but, you know, the latter, the latter of is just like... Yeah, gone. so um, uh, so he asked me what about intermediate groups and beetles? Uh, it basically explain something about the musculature of the lateral penite in Coleoptera. So um, I explained that in this article, Budenow 2018 Arthropod Structure and Development, this is from unpublished data. So I actually um, reject my uh, ground plan homology hypothesis for the Coleoptera based on the Arcus Um, But what I can say is that I spent a very long amount of time thinking about the alignment of the muscles uh, for the male genitalia of the coleoptera because there are muscles that control the claspers and there's muscles that control the penis. And then there should be muscles that control the lateral penite. <clears throat> because the polyphaga don't have a third thing between the penis and the claspers, um, it was extremely hard to tell whether or not this was the gonos, uh, lateral penite, or if it was the stylus. Um, this was reasonably well interpretable as a stylus because of other special features of the homology. So the length, the 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 um, the, the sensilla armament, other features. Um, but that was also that was a very difficult alignment problem because that intermediate structure isn't present. And so it's also absent in Mixophaga, which is the third suborder. With so, what basically what this is saying uh, to to reiterate an important point to me is that we either have loss of the lateral penite and its muscles in the coleoptera with a regain of a pair of opposable digits with um, their own musculature, or they're retained with losses that I would argue are due to the functional mechanics of the genitalia in copulo or just alone. And we do not have a good sense at this point of how the male genitalia of coleoptera work. Kind of in general, there's a lot of work done on sperm pumps and things, but that's pretty easy to figure out. That's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, this is a, a crane fly and that's actually really crazy, but that's a different story. Trying to get CT scans of them in copulo is, 
challenge from what I understand. Yeah, um, I think I've got one or two um, pairs of ants in copula. If you didn't show them? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a great point. So um, Ben has pointed out that I disappointed the audience by not showing ants in copula using x-rays. Sorry. <laughs> On the subject though of, of the CT scanning, um, how is it now? So we're talking about the, the phenomics, yeah. and it seems as though most of the uh, the character delimitation was done by a human beings by eye. And I point out, and I kind of wonder, have there been any advances in um, either using mathematical models for segmentation, sort of, I want to call it like whole part, you know, like a, what would you call it? Um, uh, finite element models. Um, any, are there any statistical advances uh, that I'm thinking of? Yeah. So I will I will take a guess at what you what your what method yeah. you're you're thinking of. Um, so he asked me, are there any methods that improve our ability to extract character information from micro CT scans? Currently, I can say that there's methods that make the processing of the data to the point that we can do this three dimensional render. There's definitely methods that make that a lot easier, but they still require someone at this point to do something initially to seed the model. Um, but uh, you know, it's conceivable that something will happen. But once you have the the model, currently you do have to make sense of it. By I right now, comparatively, uh, one could conceivably use um, geometric morphometrics. My major issue with that is that geometric morphometrics requires homologous landmarks. And when you move, when you gain a structure, you can't account for that. And when you lose a structure, you can't account, you can't account for that. So geometric morphometrics is does not capture the information that we care about for macro comparisons like genitalia. We can use character matrices like we use for phylogenetics, um, but that still requires someone to look. And at this point, there's no easy way of doing that. There is a method called diffeomorphy that allows us to statistically average shape differences between things, which allows us to account for gains and losses without explicitly coding those in. Is this something a bit like, uh, I saw like a landmark <laughs> agnostic, is PCA, that's what yeah. I'm trying to think of. Is, there, is this like a landmark agnostic PCA that you're talking about? Uh, or a bit yeah. of a different approach. Basically. But we can we can get into yeah, the details yeah. of that later. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Cool. All right. <laughs> so you, you pointed out a couple of I guess major examples where significant morphological characters didn't fall the function. Yeah. yeah. But I think there's lots of Lots of cases where they put in those. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea like how common it is? Right. So he asked me. Um, I think everybody can hear the mic. Oh, great. Yeah. Up there, kind of okay. Yeah. Excuse me. I'm just I'm just uh, trained. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, if I were to think about the portion of characters that are parsimonious versus unparsimonious, I would say currently I don't think that there's been a complete enough. Um, accounting for character variation in enough uh, sclerites or enough, you know, mechanical complexes to be able to give a meaningful answer to that. But I think that's a really interesting path of inquiry, and um, that ties to a couple of other directions of inquiry, um, like disparity analysis. Yes, ma'am. So following up on that, the incongruence or lack of parsimony may also be in the guise of incorrect homology. Mm -hmm. And I'm and, thinking about that, the LPE specifically. Yeah, yeah and this, <laughs> and this is something that has us licking our wounds in proctor trupa morph morphology yeah. is what we thought versus now in the age of phylogenomics where, where you just can't deny the, the quantity of data, some of the morphological structures that we put so much emphasis on, like Simon Van Nort, co-author co here, we've been tricked. Like we just, we thought we had the, the homology. We really did. 
And we had great hypotheses behind that. But this huge amount of other data independently derived just says, mm, maybe not. And yeah. I'm one that that has me more concerned. Like, Jesus, how many times does this happen? Yeah. So thinking about homology assessments, um, there are a number of really tricky cases. Um, and there are a number, so when I think of ants, for example, I can think of a lot of cases of stunningly, stunningly similar things that have evolved very, very, very clearly independently, um, including, for example, spines in the mesosoma of the Atini, which is a particular tribe of ants. When these spines occur, and they occur with some frequency, even including branching sometimes, very phylogenetically distant, the exact same areas of the epidermis relative to the, to the sclera. So what is up with that? Um, I think that actually like my, my favored answer to that is that we just need to take more, a closer look, look anew with like, the, the scales falling off of the eyes. So to return to the idea of you know, historically using morphology to infer phylogeny, to infer evolution, to infer morphological evolution. Now we just look at morphology totally. There are some real crazy issues. And when we think about the ladder of penite, that totally drove me up the wall. But once I figured that out, once I realized that that is a distinct pair of sclerites with muscles that's autapomorphic in holometabola, so many things snapped into place. And if we think of the genitalia of the Neuropterida, so if some of us are familiar with the Asbooks and their genitalic system, their system requires the origin of three separate pairs of genital appendages. That's not necessary if you think about the sclerites and their muscles and that sclerites can fragment, they can fuse together, and already ancestrally, there is a pair of additional appendages that have muscles. So really, you know, we just have to take it case by case at this point. Okay. Thanks very much, Brent. Good luck with your new adventure in Germany. Feeling dumb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got one question. I'm going to be better. Okay, we've come to the closure of this meeting, but before we close, before we leave, it's time to hand the gavel over. Oh, wait, let me get a photo. We need a photo. Please, kidding. Yeah, I know. And you grow here. Good. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Uh, no objections. Meeting is adjourned.